It's uh, seven oh one. I apologise for being a minute late. Uh, we've just had a few technical problems getting connected. But good evening. Um, for those of you that don't know, I'm Peter Bake, and I'm the MC for the meeting tonight. So welcome to this, our last meeting for 2022. And welcome also to anyone who is joining us for the first time. Um, welcome. Um, I don't know who you are, but uh, maybe next year we'll catch up. Uh, just a reminder that the meeting is being recorded and goes on to the World Wide Web. So if you do not want to be universally seen, it may be a good idea just to turn off your camera. I'm a bit of an egotist and uh, I'm hoping everyone out in the World Wide Web is uh, looking at me, but um, we'll wait and see. But the meeting uh, tonight is our usual format. First, we'll have a guest speaker, then a short musical interlude. Uh, oops, uh, someone's knocked off my... Uh, where's, oh, I've lost my notes. We'll have a short musical interlude and uh, uh, where you can have some light refreshments, uh, those refreshments at your own expense. Um, following the break, we'll have our president, Hugh McDonald. He'll present his report, after which the iHelp team will be available to answer your technical problems and or enlighten us with some of your gems of wisdom. We'll then close the formal meeting, but leave the Zoom active for a while for anyone who is tired, uh, everyone who is tired and wants to go to bed. But uh, during the presenter's talk, should you wish to add a comment or ask a question or say anything, use the, rain, the raise hand icon, which is in the reactions icon on the bottom of your Zoom screen. I'm not sure if you're on that other mob, the Apple mob, what it uh, looks like on yours. And either I or the speaker or someone will acknowledge you and sort of get you to speak. So our presenter tonight is a learned uh, member of uh, LPC, Philip Lynch, who has had a long and interesting career in uh, IT related fields. And his dozens of anecdotes and stories about hilarious and maybe tragic situations. So Philip has agreed to share some of them with us. I am sure he will be interesting, informative and entertaining, uh, entertaining you. And I just have to, he may raise this, but uh, my wife had a phone call from a friend of hers uh, yesterday and their daughter who's uh, up in Sydney uh, on holidays, they got a, a message from her that she dropped her phone into the toilet. She forgot to pay a bill and it was urgent and would they pay the bill for her? So uh, my friend's thinking his poor little daughter was in distress, paid the bill. Then he rang her and she said, hello, what's wrong? So um, he got onto the bank and got it knocked on the head. That just shows you what's going out there. Anyway, over <coughs> to you, Philip. Thank you, Peter. You've built me up a bit more than I'm, I'm um, <laughs> bound to actually hit, but uh, here we'll go. Uh, this long and interesting career is, is a bit of a fallacy. I'm just old, that's all. Um, and I'm a fairly young member of Melbourne CPC user group, having only joined three years ago. So uh, it's an interesting session for that. A little bit about myself. I'm actually a chemist, not a can you dispense me a pill type, but here's a bag of dog's guts, what killed it type of chemist. Uh, and I started uh, real work as a was a full-time chemist back in the uh, early 70s. Uh, and obviously I worked in a laboratory. And I soon found that I actually didn't like working in laboratories. There's all this, it was a wet laboratory in that we didn't have all this great instrumentation. Uh, there was just stuff everywhere and it smelt and you got dirty mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes it was quite dangerous. And it so happened the organisation for which I worked had bought a U-Butte uh, computer system, a, a Hewlett Packard from the, from the 70s. And one of the rationale for buying this was to set up a laboratory management system. Now, no one knew what that meant. Uh, so they engaged uh, a succession of consultants to try and help us out. And in the end, we got something going uh, and I found I preferred that <laughs> to anything else. Uh, 
<laughs> so I actually moved to another organisation to do exactly the same thing, and that is build a laboratory um, automation and information system. Uh, that took me a couple of years, and I stayed there a few years longer. But I do have the honour of saying that that thing last, outlasted me about 15 years. It took them that long to be able to replace it. Now, either it was really good or they were just stingy, I don't know. But uh, I know it was still going for a long time. And I used to get calls about it. But having said that, I, um, I, then became, I was then a, a full-time IT person. And uh, I worked for the government for a long time. Uh, I was the uh, chief information officer for a department that no longer exists in Victoria. That is the Department of Primary Industries, which, in covered, which covered ag conservation, oh, what else? Um, water, uh, land titles and, and other bits and pieces. Uh, and then just after the year 2000, um, where I had gone on record say, as saying, planes aren't going to fall from the sky, lifts aren't going to get stuck uh, between floors just because the clock ticks over. Uh, I decided I'd have enough, had enough of that organisation, or I think more importantly, they decided they'd have enough of me. Uh, what I did um, do was actually call out everyone who was spending lots of money on equipment they never needed just to satisfy uh, the year 2000 stuff. So I, I went out on a, on, a, on a rather high note in that context. And ever since then, I've worked for myself. Now, I have lots of stories of things I've done but a common theme will be, I was having a drink with someone and uh, things went from there. I've picked out two. The first one is a payroll recovery I did and it was some time ago. And the other one was a fraud case I was involved in. I wasn't a frauder, um, but I caught the frauder. The payroll recovery uh, was interesting in that it really stretched me. Uh, I was having a regular drink with a, a friend of mine who was an accountant, in fact, ran a fairly large payroll. Um, some 10,000 pays they, they knocked out every, every pay period. So it wasn't small by any stretch of imagination. In the past, and I had nothing to do with them, um, they had run their payroll in-house, uh, but they decided several years prior to move to SAP payroll uh, and they elected to use an external provider who also provided SAP payroll to and other things SAP related to several other organisations. Uh, that, that went on merrily for several years. Um, and, uh, but then they decided uh, that they weren't quite getting their money's worth. Uh, uh, this organisation installed a patch for them, but they put on someone else's payroll, uh, which caused quite a few um, over and under payments. Uh, they were having speed, uh, performance issues, speed and uptime and, and, and access. So they decided to go out and bring it back in-house. And at the same time, they moved to Oracle. Now, you can imagine a payroll of 10,000 people. Uh, it's, it's quite a lot of data. And they really didn't want to uh, move it across their Oracle system. So they paid this other organisation uh, quite an astem substantial amount of money to actually keep their old payroll system running and uh, so that they could access it for historical purposes and reporting purposes and, and um, compliance purposes. Now, that, that was fine, all well and good. That went on for several years. And then this organisation, external organisation, announced their intention to migrate their historical um, SAP pay, payroll <coughs> The new hardware and an updated database. Everything seemed okay. They're still going to run payroll for a lot of other organisations, and everything went fine. Um, uh, they they um, went through the migration. My comment to my friend was, you know, if this is me, I'd actually ask for a backup tape that I had before they actually did it. Why? Uh, well, it's not going to cost you any. Why not? Well. Several months after this migration occurred, they tried to access their payroll and it didn't work. Uh, nothing worked. And um, so they said, well, roll it back. And uh, I'm very young, well, and I've got to say goodbye. We can't. 
because we no longer have that hardware. Well, give us some tapes and we'll see what we can do. Oh, we can't. We inadvertently erase them all. So they were left with nothing. Uh, but they did have this backup tape. So for several weeks, they searched around for someone to actually recover their payroll. And again, over a beer, this friend of mine said, we're having no luck. How would you like to do it? And I said, never done it before. Got no idea how this um, SAP runs on uh, IBM hardware. No idea about DB2. He said, well, neither have we. Anyway, I took on the job um, to do it. Now, that was really interesting. Uh, they were going to post me the tape. I said, no, no, I'll go and pick it up, take it to your own <coughs> in the top of your database. Uh, and I hired some space at IBM up in, in um, New South Wales and Sydney. And I flew up this tape sitting on my lap and I walked into Mr. IBM and I said, um, now let's see if we can read this tape. And we couldn't. And uh, I was somewhat devastated seeing I was flying, I put up my own expense uh, and I wasn't going to get a cracker out of it if nothing worked. But the kind sys engineer said, look, if you leave it in our control environment for a couple of days, it might acclimatise. Excuse me, and we might be able to read it. So a week later, he rang me up and said, yep, we've been able to read the tape and we've copied it onto one of our machines. But guess what? Uh, we've got no one who can build that DB2 because it's a decade old and we've got no one who can do any more with it. Uh, so, but you, you're quite happy to keep on paying for our facilities and, uh, and keep on working it out yourself. So I scratched around and um, asked a few people. I ended up um, contracting a, an engineer, a sys engineer from, who lived in Brisbane and he was able to do all this stuff remotely and he, he was able to build up this environment. And he said, I can do all this, but I can't get the database because I've got no idea what version it is. So I went back to the original mob and said, give me all the version details. And uh, they kindly did. And I scratched around and found another engineer, a, D a database engineer who lived in, in, um, in Darwin. And uh, three or four weeks later, he came back and said, I've built the database and I've got your data. What do you want me to do with it? And I said, well, how about dumping all the tables out and giving me access to it? And I'll see what we can do. I didn't know the structure of the database. Uh, they didn't know the structure um, of the okay. database. And, but we moved this along and I got it and uh, I loaded it up, each of the tables individually into a, I think it was a, a SQL database, or well, it was a SQL database. It could have been uh, MySQL, could have been uh, Postgres or any of those things. I have no recollection because this was some 18 years ago now. And um, we loaded it up. Now, uh, it took about two more months for me to make sense of the data. Every week, this mob insisted I give them a report telling them where I was at. They were getting towy. They were starting to blame me that they'd been out without their payroll data for three or four months. Uh, but I said, well, I can't do anything about it. Um, you'll get it when I get it. Uh, but eventually, uh, we actually uh, got success. Uh, I was able to uh, reverse, in, well, it wasn't reverse engineer the table, just work out all the, the linkages that were in the, in the data I had. And I was able to uh, generate something that actually gave them their entire history. Uh, they were happy, I was happy, and they paid me. Uh, I was able to afford a wedding for my daughter. Um, elsewise, she would have had sandwiches down the local park. Uh, it was really interesting, but I found out it was highly political um, in the sense that uh, they didn't want me to tell anyone what I was doing. They didn't want me to tell anyone what I achieved. And the people I had hired in uh, the, and the uh, IBM um, systems area, we all called it Pro, uh, Project X because we weren't allowed to put a name on it. Of course, everyone knew because they could read the information was on the tapes and uh, in, in the documentation I sent it sent them. Would I do it again? No. 
Uh, was it worth it for me? Yes, it was, because I got some a fair bit more work out of that organisation over the years. Did I learn things from it? No, I certainly did. Don't trust outsources um, was the first thing I learned. And uh, were we all friends at the end? I think we were. I did find out after all this was over that the organisation who lost the data quoted them about twice what I charged for them to actually do the recovery. Uh, but they weren't prepared to, to go down that track and, and I say good on them. But that was about it. I said, I learned a, a little bit about DB2. Uh, I learned a little bit about SAP, but I learned a lot about people. Um, as long as I gave them a report every week saying things were progressing, didn't really matter what was in the report, they were happy. Uh, the one week when I was actually away, I didn't give them a report, they were most up the turd. And this uh, colleague of mine rang me and said, but you better get the report in. I said, but I'm not contract to do that, but do it anyway. So I copied the last one. Uh, and that, that seemed to put them all, all together. I can talk about this, all the nuts and bolts for, uh, for hours. I've just got um, dot points. Uh, and I, I'm haste to add, I, I was under, I am under an NDA. So you notice I haven't mentioned any any organisations, um, and I, uh, I did actually contact them. Well, this colleague of mine who still works there, uh, if I could actually talk about this in a general sense, uh, I contacted him today. He said yes, that's fine. I don't know what he would have done, or what I would have done had he said no. Uh, and he actually ran it out through information. I had no idea how many people they paid, and I was quite staggered when he told me over ten thousand, and they had about thirty thousand. Um, individuals recorded in the um, in that uh, payroll database I recovered for them. Uh, that, that went a lot quicker than I thought. I was thinking thought people might have interrupted me and said, you quit, can't do that or you can do that. Well, that was really boring, but no one has. So um, I'm going to go, I'm only going to talk about two things here. So uh, if you need to stretch it out, by all means, let me know. I've got no idea what the time is. Oh, I can see I've done that in 15 minutes. Uh, I participated in a, a bookkeeper fraud investigation um, some years ago. And as I said, a common theme, I was having a beer with someone. Uh, this is a chap I used to work with and, and his um, partner owned a small business. I had uh, previously done some mates work in their small business and that I advised them that uh, uh, about how they might want to perform some backup to their data, might want to put some UPSs in there to keep things going, and they might want to upgrade some of their kit, but, but nothing that I was actually involved in. I just gave them the general advice. But he said to me over a beer, but they're having trouble in that they're, they're getting calls from their suppliers. And this was a retailer plus a wholesaler. And they're getting calls from their wholesale suppliers uh, suggesting that some of their invoices weren't being paid. It was just one out of a whole bunch for different um, different suppliers. And uh, he said, we've been through the books. Uh, we've, we've looked at the, uh, the invoices coming in. They've been marked paid. We looked at the bank reconciliation. That amount of money has gone out to the appropriate bank. We've got no idea what's going on. Um, and he said, um, you reckon you come in and have a look? And I said, well, oh, I can't see why not. They were using MYOB, uh, something I realised I don't really like. Uh, it took a couple of days to come to, to grips with that. And, and um, we collectively dumped out all those invoices going over three years. Uh, we downloaded the bank's EFT payment system or payment uh, records and everything matched up, absolutely everything. So we went back to one supplier they knew quite well and said, can you actually give us some details of some of these invoices that you have claimed haven't been paid? Uh, and they did. And I looked at them and they looked at them and we said, yes, these have been paid. So I said, why don't we go back to the bank and actually ask them for detailed download of all the EFT payments? What we were getting from the bank was uh, a, um, a name to which it had been paid the amount and uh, the business's um, uh, record of invoice ID. And we did. And what we found was that 
when the bookkeeper was actually entering the odd invoice in, she was, if the invoice was from Fred's uh, supplies, she was entering Fred's supplies in the description, but putting in her own bank account number. And so to all intents and purposes that the um, business is in, things were being paid. It, I actually went back to the bank after this and said, uh, this is hopeless because blah, 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 blah. Uh, anyone can put their numbers in and or whatever they like in there. And it, it's, it's just really not a record of what you've paid it for. And to, the, to my surprise, the bank actually changed their system so that the um, receiver's bank account number was clearly displayed irrespective of what the person put in. I sent my report uh, to this business on the Friday. Uh, they went to the police on Friday afternoon. They said, no, you've got to go to the fraud squad. They rolled up to the fraud squad on Saturday morning. Fraud squad said, we're not open on the weekend. Come back on Monday. In that um, intervening period, they'd contacted the bookkeeper and told you what, what, they, what they'd found and what they was going to do. The bookkeeper had a bit of a cry and said, uh, I'll pay you back. I'm sorry, I was, I was, I was in, a, in a down spot, to, you know, how it goes. Uh, so they accepted that. She wasn't sacked. Uh, she wasn't reported to police. She paid the money back. However... She ended up paying the money back by doing something very similar for their books and paying them back with their own money. Uh, suffice to say that she did get sacked in the end. Uh, it's also probably worth noting that the business is no longer operating. And to my annoyance, it took them three months to pay me. Uh, so I resolved then that uh, if ever I do work for any someone I have a more than casual relationship with, uh, they're going to pay me up front rather than after the event. Uh, now, that's about all I wanted to say, and I thought I could stretch that out for about 40 minutes, but I've, I've kept it to under half an hour. Uh, I hope you're not too disappointed in me, but I hope someone's actually got a question. John Hall's got one for you, Philip. John. Hi, Philip. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the couple of times I've asked questions and uh, and you've you've helped me. I really appreciate that. And it's good to have somebody like you in our club. Um, but you say you joined three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, would you tell, mind telling us why you joined Melbourne PC? Because we've, we've been going for a long time. And, uh, well, well, I know. Uh, in fact, I know some of your or knew some of your long-standing members well before you guys started and uh i've actually mentioned it to them uh i uh, i didn't join when you first started uh not because i had too much on my plate not because i didn't want to do it but uh there was at least one person there who who didn't get on with me uh and I didn't get on with that person. So I said, it's best if we stay apart. Um, but about three years ago, well, just before I joined, uh, I had a customer with a resource management system, which was written, the front end was written in Access, and they wanted a change to it. And I know enough about that Access front end to be dangerous. And I said, it's... Uh, and I don't want to change it. Uh, unfortunately for this mob, the person who developed it for them, it was a company used, uh, they're panel leaders, and it was, it was used right around Australia, but the person who developed it had retired and uh, no longer wanted to provide any support. The person he sold the business to was only half interested in supporting it. Now I thought, now where am I going to find someone who can tell me about um, access? So I thought, I wonder if the Melbourne PC user group has, and I looked up the website, and there, what's this access gig? Uh, so I said, oh, I'm not going to ask them, I'll join first. So I did join, and uh, I sent an email off to the access gig convener, convener, and he spent a whole Saturday afternoon remotely 
explaining what the customer wanted, my customer wanted, was stupid. But if I, they really want to go ahead with this is how to do it. And I was so impressed uh, with that level of um, response. Uh, I said, well, I'm joined now. I'll stay joined. Uh, so, John, that's, that's what it was. I actually got something out of it up front, and I joined specifically to get something out of it. Um, and I was really happy I did. Uh, suffice to say, I passed on his advice, and uh, I can't remember his name now. Isn't that terrible? Uh, to the customer and said, look, I'm not going to do it. Um, you, I've got an expert who says don't do it. And so they didn't do it. Uh, and as you know, John, um, soon, after I, soon after I joined, uh, uh, Melbourne PC user group decided to migrate from the Microsoft hosting to Google hosting. And uh, the, the propeller head said, uh, we need some people to help our members. Uh, anyone know a little bit about email? I said, oh, look, I might know a little bit. Uh, so I put my hand up and so I've been involved in that for the last two years. And I've enjoyed very, very great. almost every minute of it, almost every minute of it. It's been yeah. great. Good on you. Yeah. Well, that's what, that's what our club's all about. And uh, mm. it's nice to see people like you joining us still. All I want to know is how, how we can get more people like you to join us. <laughs> well, you probably want them a bit younger than me. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, that's it. Yeah. Well, we'll, we've got a new young president now, Hugh McDonald. So hopefully, mm. yeah, he can bring a few more youngsters on for us. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that, Phil. Cheers. No problem. Oh, there is a hand up. I can see it. Now, what do I do? I'm on one of these Apple things, so I actually have to press a few buttons to find it. John Swale, you had your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Peter. And thanks, Philip. It's always interesting when we go back to all the old things about the, the fundamentals, backups. You need mm. to do the backups. You need to do them regularly. And you need to test them. And I think it's good to get this reminder all the time. And thank oh. you for all the work that you've been doing. Oh, not a problem. Uh, actually, uh, the backup thing, I, anyone who knows me knows I'm really hot on backup and testing. Um, a diff, totally different organisation, but I was helping a friend with um, upgrading an old network. Well, it wasn't an old network, so even those days. This is back in 95, 96. He was upgrading a network, the network server, which, amongst other things, held their payroll as well. And in those days, it wasn't as easy as it later became. You had to rebuild the system completely. And because disks were very expensive, they were uh, doubling the capacity of disks, they didn't actually do what you do now is take the old disk out and keep it. And uh, they had to destroy the old disk. And uh, I got there and uh, I said, oh, uh, you know, we need three backups. He said, no, I've done two. No, no, I've done two. We'll do it. I said, but please, let's do a third. Just humor me. It only takes two hours. Uh, we'll go out and have some tea. So we did another backup and we, we got his thing. Uh, and and we, I checked the backup. Um, as you said, I, the, no point in having a backup. We haven't tested it. So I, I tested it to make sure it would work. Then we did our upgrade. We destroyed the old device. We put his first backup in and it didn't work. We put his second back up and it didn't work. And this bloke saying, hmm, I won't have a job. Uh, luckily, the backup we did when we were having tea uh, and tested uh, did work. And that has actually cemented my views of backups for every a day. And uh, I've also said to people, with this day and age, if you actually have to do something to do a backup, you've lost it. Um, everything I do with backups now is done to the cloud and it's automatic. No one has to do a damn thing. And, uh, and I, I can't think of a, an, a better way of doing it, actually. Uh, and uh, but it's where I like to be. And even those things that are automatic, uh, I have, well, I have a customer, we, we do that. They're, they've got several terabytes it's on, on, in Dropbox and uh, once a week, I actually make them recover one document from the backup. And it's, it's just a random document. I wrote a random number generator to, 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 or random generator to actually pick up a document. So you bring that back and you, and you sign it off. So he, he allocates that to one of his staff members. And that's just what they do. 
And uh, I think it has got us out of trouble a couple of times just from doing that. It's actually shown us when the backup hasn't worked, that's for sure. Come on, there must be fun more. Well, I'll, I'll put it to you. You're a great believer in backups. Just for members that may not know, can you give us just a simple uh, rules that you should do, how you would say that someone like me should back up? Well, um, someone like you, uh, I would buy, for a, per, for, a, for a private person, I would spend $130 a year on buying uh, a subscription to Microsoft 365. That gives you a, actually gives you six terabytes if you, if, you, if you gain the system, but it gives you a terabyte. You um, point all your documents and data for your documents in that uh, Office 365 and you let it back up. Now what that, and just let it happen and just check it to make sure it's running. Um, and what that gives you is not only today's data, but it gives you a history of files. You can go back. So if you actually, you can inadvertently delete something, you may well get uh, a, a, a crypto virus that goes through and encrypts everything. Well, that's fine because you know when you got it, you can actually recover from the day before without actually doing any more. And you don't have to get off your bum um, to do it. You don't have to do anything. Just have your computers connected to the internet and keep your eye on the little wheel at the bottom saying, yes, I'm backed up. Now, a lot of people don't agree with me, by the way, Peter. Uh, uh, there, there are members who say, no, I, 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 do, I press this button every week and I put it on this external drive and I say well that's your decision um, it's not the decision I'd make well well that's me I I back up to two or three external hard drives one of which is my daughter's at her place yep so it's off site because a, a friend of mine alerted me he backed everything up but everything he backed up to an external drive was beside his computer and his house burnt down yeah, I, that, that's, I've seen a lot of people do that as well. Um, but Peter, as I said, that my opinion is only my opinion. Other people want to do it different ways. Uh, I, just, I just don't like the idea of being tied down to do something. Uh, if I can make it automatic. That's, I, I still use a lot of uh, shell scripting. And people will say, oh, why don't you use a GUI to do that? And I say, well, there are three reasons I, I use shell scripting. One, I can. Uh, two, if I have to repeat the damn thing, I've got it and I don't have to think about how I did it. And three, it's documented for me. I can see exactly what I did and, and what mistake I made or something went wrong. So I'm in that way, I'm a, I'm a dinosaur. Uh, how, many, how many people do you see who, who, who predominantly sit in the command shell? Uh, me. Well, it's actually terminal now, um, a PowerShell terminal. I, I use that a lot. In a Windows environment, I use Command Shell on, on a Linux box. Uh, and the odd time I have to use a Mac, I get in the terminal mode there too, where I can. You've obviously started something. There's three hands up. So, uh, Cedric, you, you've got a comment or a question? Uh, yes. Uh, um You'd saying that you uh, just check that it's actually the backups are running and so forth. I'm just wondering, I want to check what you mean there. Do you mean that just on the icon, it's uh, the OneDrive icon it is saying up to date? Is that how you can check it's well, running or, or you got another you, way? You do two things. Um, you, you, you check on the, the icon to say, see it's running, but you also click on the that icon and it'll bring up the recent files that's moved up. Good, okay, and, yep. And if, you, if you've, yeah, if you've yeah. been working on something and it's, um, and it's not in, it, it's in the, your latest one's not in there, you've got a problem. And you do get problems with it, there's no doubt about it. Yep. I've seen them stall. <clears throat> yeah, I've, I don't have as much files as you're talking about. So I've just uh, purchased a hundred gig from uh, 
one drive, for mm. one drive personal. But, uh, yes, and, and that's, that, that's as good as any. As, as good as any too. Yep, thanks. Yeah. I, I Personally, I have um, something like, uh, what do you think, uh, three gig of stuff backed up across various accounts. Uh, sorry, three terabytes backed up across various accounts. Uh, so I'd hate to have to download it all. Um, it would actually, uh, oh, we use a lot of data here. Um, all our stuff, we're on Foxtel with, on the, connected to the internet, so everything, everything comes across the internet. Uh, our, our average download here is two and a half terabytes a month. So uh, that's in our house. So uh, it's, uh, so I guess probably about getting everything back wouldn't actually break the bank, it'd just double it per a month. Mm. Might take a little while. I've got my hand up to go to fiber. So uh, so I'm hoping I'll, I'll, uh, that'll happen sooner rather than later. Harry, Harry Lewis has got a question for you or a comment. Well, it is a, que <clears throat> it is a question. Something Philip said suggested to me that your OneDrive is secure if you get invaded by ransomware. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought that typically that kind of malware will infect all connected drives. It will, but OneDrive gives you the ability to go back to deleted files. So you've got a file sitting up on OneDrive called Fred, yeah. and that, that becomes encrypted, which it will happen. Yes. You can, I mean, if if you've got a, a bulk amount to do, you just ask Mr. Mr. Microsoft to re restore you back to two days ago. Okay, so that's not live in your drive. No, no, no. It's it's, it's all right. up with Mr. Right. Microsoft. Right, fine. Which you don't have with the physical U USB drive. Oh, not with a USB. I mean, no. if if you put in a NAS. Uh, you can have time machine type stuff on a NAS, right. but it's something you've got to do. But yeah. uh, the problem with, I also have a NAS here, but the problem with the NAS, of course, is it, it's in the one house. And as Peter said, if a house burns down or you're robbed, um, you've lost it all. Yes, I see that Dave, by the way, certainly was with us. I haven't looked, seen everybody. He, he had a terrible story about somebody with the two houses and they kept the backup in the other house and they both burned down but uh, that, that was uh, I mean, in the Black you, Saturday you, fires, I think. You, you can't you can't you can't um you can't help bad luck can you in yeah. some way it's uh it's a bit like the the, the argument i tell people that uh, or the argument I, I give to people that the 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 data centers we have in in um well, microsoft or Amazon have around the world. It's it's just not one physical building per data center. It's it's several buildings. And oh, what happens? What happens to the bomb? It takes them all out. I said, well, we're all gone anyway. So what's it matter? Uh, yeah. So uh, at, at some point in time, there's a juggling thing. Yeah. Uh, Richard, you've got a question for Philip. Yeah, I just a comment. Um, sort of back backups only half the story. Sort of organizations you want to make sure that they know how to recover from the backups. There's uh we've had a yeah. few stories in the past that people have been religiously doing backups. And then when they've finally gone to do the recovery, they found that they'd been backing up to the wrong place. And their backups have been empty. <laughs> I I had a customer like that and um they uh, they had a they they had a provider uh, you bought of their well they're a retail organisation so they supplied the, the the turnkey system uh, and I've still got this customer by the way uh, and they were they had a server sitting on a bench and I said yeah right here um, and someone was putting in the tape every night and they said we can't seem to get something back and I and I looked at it and I said, that's because you're not backing up. All you're doing is pressing a button. So they had all this history of backups going back two or three years. And I rang the, the people who put in this, oh, that's not, that wasn't our job. 
And I said, but you gave, them a, you gave them a script to run. Oh, yeah, but that was only a sample script. So, um, so yes, I've, 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 um, I've been there on that track with them. But, um, uh, you have to do it. Very good. Yeah, can I put in a word in present company for the image backup? Because what you talked about is essentially a file backup. And I keep mm. all my working files in one or another cloud drive. I, I, yeah. I use um, drop, Dropbox as well as a OneDrive. But to me, the advantage of the image backup is, is the disk failure scenario. Um, where you have to go through the entire hassle of reinstalling all your programs. If you start with a fresh disk, you've got your data, but you've mm. still got to reinstall your programs. So if you've got an intact image backup, it just puts the disk back where it was at the time of the backup. Or you know, I've used them myself to update disks, mainly for one side with a failure. So I'm not saying we don't use the cloud because I, the redundancy and the double redundancy, if you like, Philip, I think is an important feature. In other words, the data is secure in however many bomb-proof places, not just one. And the 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 uh, the um, versioning feature is clearly very important. Mm. Harry, you and I have discussed this a couple of times uh, in terms of image backups, but um, I got burnt many years ago. Uh, with a image back on netware uh, back up on netware uh, the the bindery got corrupted and all our backups were in uh, image backups and it brought yeah. back a corrupted bindery and we couldn't fix it yeah uh, and it was it was it took us three days to find out what had occurred we'd actually bought in so this is this is a netware fault problem. Uh, we we bought in we merged with an organisation and bought in across all their data. They had an, an errant character in one of their paths, and it corrupted the bindery. Um, so we 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 did several restores and we did a binary chop. We'll, we'll get to there. We'll get to there. We'll get to there until we actually got the file again. And once we knew what it was, we wrote to Mister Netware and said. Um, Mr. Novell, can you fix this up um, down the track? Uh, we'll deal with it this time. But I got burnt with it. It's oh. like so many things with me. If 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 um, if I get a bad beer at a pub, I don't go back. Look, I'm I'm not. I say sympathetic is not the right word. I'm interested in the extent to which we are trusting free backup programs when the actual process is so complex. Mm. because it's creating this file so you've got the single file which is the image file which is of course nothing like a clone right so i'm not so i'm thinking i've always thought it wouldn't take much for that to go wrong mm. uh, uh, i don't rely entirely on it at all because i say my data is all in the cloud as well um, and i have succeeded uh, I gave up on a cronist because I fell out with them twice and got my money back. Uh, and I can't remember why now. It wasn't because they failed to do the, do the thing. And then I, I, I use Macrium now and I pay them so that I can use it on multiple computers. And I have used it successfully. But I mm -hmm. still think we're all on probably quite thin ice there because of the sheer complexity of what it's doing in order to create an image which is constructed and then reconstructed. And a good example of that is because we've had discussions in, in Yammer and so on about these things in the past, uh, the emphasis on incremental backups, because then that is again, a level of complexity over and above the translation process and the compression processes that are going on, because you've also got knitting them all together. Now, I believe Apple's system works pretty well and, and somebody else here and I have agreed that if you had a choice between a, a Mac and a PC and it was a toss up, you'd go for the Mac because of time machine, right? Mm -hmm. Not just because of the beautiful interface, but it does help. But um, 
in, in, the, in the Windows world, you're in a bit of a jungle, I think, in that respect. And there are lots of products and they're all doing something very, very complicated. And I'm surprised that we don't hear more about failures, to be quite honest. Oh, I think we do. I've certainly heard of quite a few. Um, been involved in quite a few stories with 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 failures, and uh, especially incremental ones. And again, once bitten, twice shy. I yeah. stay away from incremental ones. What's changed uh, over the over the years is just the our capacity to, to hold things. Uh, I go back to when we were using those uh, six hundred BPI uh, reel to reel tapes. And you couldn't put a lot on them. Right. Uh, then, they, then we got the sixty-two fifty densities, and um, we backed up through them. We well, I've backed up to DAT tapes, to um, VHS tapes, uh, to DVD drives, and all of those things. And what we, what where we are now, in my, in my belief, is we have sufficient ways of getting full back of what we want without having to, and they're sufficiently fast, without having to go to incrementals. It just doesn't make sense to me. I almost exclusively use full backups. Mm. I've got the space. Mm. It reduces the complexity of the, re the restore. Well, yes. And uh, it's, it's not only the complexity, it reduces the time too. Right, fair play, yeah. Because it doesn't have to do as much work knitting them mm. all together. John Hall, you've got a comment or a question? Um, I do have a both, Peter. <laughs> uh, my comment is I, I've just received a very nasty shock from uh, Acronis. Um, last year, I upgraded my Acronis from uh, well, I, I just wanted to keep up to date with Acronis, and uh, I converted one of my single-use licenses to uh, to an annual redemption for twenty-four dollars US, and I suddenly noticed a bill for sixty-nine dollars US going through my PayPal account, and when I when I uh, looked at it, I found that it was Acronis. And, uh, and they charged me a full price for a single machine. Now, they normally discount these things. Um, and uh, anyway, fortunately, I spotted it within an hour. It took me quite a lot of time to actually cancel that renewal. Um, the Cronus themselves would not do it. Uh, I had to go through a, a company in Germany I can't remember their name at the moment, but uh, they were the people who were doing the billing. I had to prove that I hadn't done a backup, of which I hadn't done. I actually uninstalled the Acronis license so that it was no longer registered to my main machine. And then eventually they gave me my money back. Um, so <clears throat> I am now looking for uh, some new software so uh, I've heard about Macrium Reflex, but I wondered if there was anybody who was willing to give us a talk about how to use Macrium Reflex. Um, I mean, you know, I haven't used it myself before, so I was wondering if there was anybody who, uh, who could give us a talk at one of these meetings or something. Let's stand silence again. Uh, <laughs> if you his hand up, he may have a comment. Um, I've, I've put my hand up for something else, but uh, certainly quite a lot of the I help people uh, um, are helping people at Macrium a lot. Um, I have used Macrium yeah. only a tiny bit. I mostly use Eesus, but I was going to ask uh, Phil a separate question about that. That's where I put my hand up. But certainly people like Dave um, Simpson and so forth, um, I'm pretty sure they're full-time users of uh, Macrium. You'll probably have to work out who's using free and who's using paid versions. Um, 
I'll come back to you shortly for the other thing I want to ask. Well, my, yeah. my, my preference would be the free one. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I use an image backup, not for backups, but for forensic work. So if I get a drive in that someone uh, that we need to do something with, I don't like touching the real drives. So I, um, I, I use a product called Drive Snapshot and that, that suits my purposes. It, it, it images, takes uh, image of that petition to drive and I can restore it anywhere. And that's, that's, that's how I do forensic work. I keep putting my hand up and someone keeps taking it down. I said, uh, I've, been asked to do a session on backups for uh, the Windows SIG in the new year. Uh, the thing about Macri and Reflect is that you can get the, the basic uh, program free that does uh, uh, incremental backups, yeah. but you can also pay extra and you can do file backups. The thing about doing backups is how much pain is it going to be to recover? If you've got a lot of data, you want to probably be backing up some of it daily. You know, there have been all the stories about people who are writing a thesis and not backed up. But if, you, if you've just got a few items, uh, you, well, with, with Word, uh, you can have uh, some uh, file a history that will get back to you. You need to look at your data, how often you change it. And if you do a major upgrade, that you should do a full backup at that stage. So it, it depends how much data you've got, how often it changes, and uh, where, where are you going to get it back from and how quickly can you do it? Just oh, so, so maybe you asked your question. Cedric, you go oh, ahead with your question. Sorry, all right. Um, the separate thing about testing backups. I have done a um, image uh, backup. I do mostly do file backups or user files. But occasionally I do a um, mm. disk image or, a, yeah, disk image because I've got a 128 uh, gig um, disk of the operating and software on it. And then I've got a terabyte uh, disk with hard a disk uh, mechanical uh, with all my uh, user files on it. In actual fact, they're in OneDrive mostly, but some that aren't OneDrive. But if I do a um, image of the 128 C drive, um, I have then made a bit of room in the one terabyte drive. Um, say, for example, disk um, partition G or something or other, and done a restore to that. Looked all right, but I wasn't quite sure how I then boot my machine from drive G or whatever it is. So it's, which would seem to me to be the last step in proving that the backup's okay if I can boot from it. Cedric, I'm no expert on uh, the Macrium and the Acronis and all that. In fact, I've hardly ever used them. But most image uh, backup allow you to actually mount the resulting uh, image you've got and actually get into individual files. And that's what I do. I said, I, I use a product called um, Drive Snapshot. And you get, well, you know, you get a whole lot of little, smaller files, two terabyte files, but they're, 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 they're just broken up because that's the way they do it. And I can then mount that, and that comes up as a drive letter, and I can pull anything and everything out. So whenever I do a, a um, an image backup uh, for forensic work, uh, generally I'm going to mount it anyway, but even if I'm not, the first thing I'll do after it's finished is actually mount it 
and make sure I can drag or one or two files off it. And if I can, then I, I'm pretty sure it's okay. That's what I recommend we do with uh, Macrium, whether it's a full backup or just a, an image back, uh, partial uh, backup. Just tell people to go in, mount the image, have a look at a couple of files, which is what you said, Philip, that you yeah. did. Yep. Yeah, just make sure that the, some of the files are backed up. Mm. If you really want to do it, then you can get another hard disk and you can copy it down to that, uh, take that as an external disk, and uh, that will be a, a disk that you can uh, boot from and you can test that. Okay, Anthony, you've got a comment, question? Well, a bit of each. Um, for, I've been using the Cronus thing, a paid-for version, for many years. And then recently, uh, the um, bloke in America, the user group, I forgot what it's called now, it was a user group relations, he sent something about how you could keep using... <coughs> An old version, but anyway, I misunderstood that, and I lashed out on the. Uh, they changed the name now. They call it Cyber Protect Home Office. So I bought that for my computer and uh, did a backup. And um, once before, when I did have a failure, I took my image thing to the computer shop, and they used it, and it saved the day. But uh, so this home office bit I've tried now, but with John Hall mentioning he'd had some other charge slipped in, I'll have to start looking closer to my account. But uh, one problem I learned afterwards, this cyber protect thing, if you change your computer, it won't work on that. You've got to buy another product. So I think previous versions, it would work on a new computer, whereas this will only restore if you're hard drive is replaced, I think. I think you've got to stay with the motherboard, but it's all um, stretching my abilities a bit, you know? So I don't know how I, John, I'll have to listen to what John said and check the bank accounts and see what little amounts. I just Jim recently- Barlow was the guy that in America that was giving user groups a, a cheaper uh, version of it. He, he was a uh, user group relation. That's him, and, yeah. And he has recently gone off using Acronis. I think he's found some don't trouble, but I don't think he's pushing it anymore. Oh, he, he died. Yeah, but he before that, he stopped doing anything. It was only about I, a month ago when um, I bought this version from, and I got the emails from him. Anyhow, we'll see. Yeah, that, that, that is uh, one of the problems I think we've got. We, we, we used to have with the um, um, a, well, the Association in America of Computer Clubs, um, we used to get a special price on a Cronus, which made it very attractive for a lot of us, and a lot of us used it. Um, but um, as I say, they seem to be ramping up the price quite a bit. So quite a lot of our members will maybe get a, a, a shock if they don't check their uh, bank balances right. regularly um, on a Cronus. Uh, you know, I was quite surprised. I, if it had been twenty four ninety nine, which it was uh, when I changed it, American, which I think would have been about nearly forty dollars Australian, we've given the exchange exchange rate at the moment. I would have still paid it. But sixty nine dollars comes up over a hundred bucks Australian. I'm not paying that. I think they've changed it to a very fancy name. Probably means I've got to pay some yeah, they have, powered they've, marketing. They've added people. all sorts of stuff in it, John. Yeah, and, I know. But I'm just saying progress. it's probably marketing stuff. Yeah. And you're paying for a lot of stuff you don't need. Yeah, yeah. I only paid um, twenty eight dollars something just within the last few weeks, actually. Yeah, it, they'll give you an upgrade price. They're advertising at the moment, uh, yeah, about $28 for the upgrade. But Just that like upgrade that. Ch changes your lifetime license into an annual license. Yeah. And that's what happened to me last year. And when it renewed, it came up with 
dollars American. I think oh, mine says one license download twenty eight dollars. So yeah. yeah. Oh well. No, you're, you're fine for a year. Just just keep uh, keep an eye on it when you renew, Stu. That's all. I, I hope to last a year. I don't look for twenty year guarantees now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Richard, you've got a comment? Yeah, uh, Tony, Anthony just uh, highlighted the, the problem with image backups is they're not very useful if your machine dies and you're going to a new machine with a different configuration. So data backups are far more useful from that point of view. Mm. <clears throat> what was I go back, hand up? With, um, with, with Macrium paid, it will restore to alien hardware. The other feature it's got is the, encry is the encryption, uh, uh, which is supposed to stop um, forms of malware corrupting it. You can't actually manipulate the folders using Windows Explorer for that reason. You can only use, only use Macrium, for example, to delete a, a backup. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a bit more. I'm, I'm looking at the Acronis site. It's been calling itself, a, a, uh, of course, I've now lost the name, Cy Cy Cyber Protect Home Office, if you please. Yeah. And the base price for one year sub for one computer is $50 US. And I was trying to force the Australian dollar, but I haven't found it. Well, I've got. But in fact, the, the increment for three computers is quite small. It's twenty dollars, thirty dollars. Sorry. Well, that's a bit like Microsoft pricing, isn't it? You get obviously Microsoft three six five for just under a hundred dollars for exactly one computer, and pay another thirty, and you get it for is it five or six? Uh, it, well, you get it for five or six. Um... You get it for five or six computers, but five accounts. Yeah, I always forget which is the five and which is the six, Philip. Well, it's still 30 at the end of the day. <laughs> okay, well, uh, Philip, it's uh, nearly five past eight. Um, I think you said you were going to talk for 40 minutes. So uh, you've managed to hold the fort for a good hour. Uh, provided some uh, interesting information to everyone um, and, and I think everyone's probably learnt from your um, uh, hour uh, on the screen. Um, so thank you very much on behalf of the members. Uh, thank you, thank you also for um, your help in uh, the migration. Uh, that's all beyond me. Um, you know, I'm a, I can turn a computer on and I can play solitaire. Uh, I got a bit worried about this migration, but somehow or other I got there. But uh, look, thanks very much, and thanks for your talk this evening. So yeah. we're going to have a, uh, it's five past eight, I think 10 minutes is uh, long enough. So we'll reconvene at 8.15. Uh, hopefully there's some uh, soothing music in between. And then at quarter past uh, eight, we'll have our president give his report. Well, it's 8.15, uh, the orchestra stopped, uh, their clock must be a bit faster than mine, it's just turned 18, 15, 8.15, so welcome back. Um, I'd like to pass over now to our President Hugh MacDonald to give us his report. Over to you, Hugh. Thanks very much, Peter. And, um, and thank you, Philip, for your talk. That was very interesting to hear some of your IT stories and good discussion of um, backups at the end there, very important of course. Um, so yeah, good evening everyone and um, welcome to what is my first President's Report. Um, so what I'm going to uh, talk about tonight is mostly is the uh, Monash Maker Fair. So um, I've done a bit of a, a slideshow to show you and uh, talk to that. So let me just get that up for you.
So hopefully everyone can see okay. So um, so uh, for those of you who don't know, the, the Monash Maker Fair um, was on last Sunday, um, this Sunday just gone um, at Monash University. And um, yeah, for those of you that, uh, that did go to the uh, 2019 event, uh, this was a, a lot bigger event. Um, there were there were three levels of the, the building we were in, um, full of different um, different makers and, and different uh, you know technology clubs uh, like ourselves. Um, so it was big events, um, very interesting events. Um, we were there uh, under our um, Melbourne Creators Collective brand, and so um, this is uh, our stand. Uh, pictures of our stand on the day. So um, yeah, some of the, the volunteers that we had uh, there on the day, um, Stephen Zalaga, our vice president uh, was there, talking to people and showing them some of our projects. Um, Burn Wax from the microcontroller workshop SIG um, was there, um, showing people his um, I2C uh, buzz controller which um, generated a lot of interest and um, a lot of people were, you know, stopped by to find out what it was and, and hear the, the explanation from Burns. So that was uh, very interesting to everyone. Uh, Mick Adams was also there. So, um, so we had a section uh, dedicated um, to Coda Dojo, which the club runs um, every Saturday. And uh, so we had some of the, um, the students work um, set up on those laptops. Uh, so there was a, um, a maze game. Uh, there was a, a, a car racing game and a, a sort of um, Dungeons and Dragons style uh, text based game written in Python. The other games are written in, in Scratch. And so um, yeah, a lot of, lot of kids stopped by to, to play with those and, and their parents were interested. And um, there were quite a few sign ups to Code Dojo, so that was um, that was Hello. positive from that point of view. Uh, this was our um, hydroponics um, system that we had there on display. This was um, this was first unveiled at the the two thousand nineteen Maker Fair, um, so we had it back back there this year, um, and so. Um, yeah, to like explain that a little bit, it's got a, a number of um, microcontrollers um, that you can see um, at the top there that um, that regulate temperature and and uh, and moisture and uh, and and things like that. So um, they're quite an innovative system, and um, and people were very interested to to hear about that. Twitter um, by members of people and and John Shirt and, and Brian. It was was made by our secretary Aidan Kelly, and so it's it's running a. A, uh, a web server on that little uh, WeMOS microcontroller and running a piece of software uh, called WLED, which you can log into and you can program the LEDs and you know what they display and the frequency they display. Uh, this was another uh, piece that we had. Um, so this was a, um, it's an old monitor um, that's been repurposed as a, as a digital display complete with you know, kind of um, <clears throat> reclaimed uh, timber, you know, frame uh, for it to give it that authentic sort of look. So, um, yeah, it can basically output um, anything. It's connected to a, a Raspberry Pi. So you just um, display things on the Raspberry Pi and it, uh, it displays them on the screen, but that's going to go up at the club and, uh, and be a kind of information board at the club. Um, this was the um, arcade um, game table that members of the, the Sunday session group um, have been putting together. Um, unfortunately, you're seeing it in its um, crash state. It, it was played too many times during the day, and by the end of the day, it, it crashed. Um, 
but um, yeah, it's been been made with a with an old table, um, an old monitor that's been recessed um, under the table, and a, a Raspberry Pi to to run the software, and some um, some custom uh, game controllers there, and so um, yeah, so that was that was very popular as well, um, as you can probably imagine, particularly with the kids. And so uh, that's going to, um, that permanently is on display um, in our lounge uh, at Moorabbin. So anyone wants to come and check it out and, and play it when it's in its working state, uh, you're very welcome to. Um, that This was Burns um, I2C uh, buzz controller again. You can see some of the, the explanation um, of it there in the photo. Uh, this was another uh, piece that the, the microcontroller workshop SIG um, put together. So this is a, um, someone found a, a petrol station uh, sign and they, um, they were able to reverse engineer the, the code for it um, and, and write a um, interface, a web-based interface um, where the, the text can be controlled and the, the rate of display um, can be controlled. So um, that was a another piece that attracted a lot of attention. And uh, yeah, so that was that was what we uh, displayed um, at the Monash Maker Fair. Um, so, so yeah, that was that's really the, the major thing that I um, have to report this month. Um, other than that, um, as it is the last meeting um, of the year and heading into the, the holiday season, um, I'd like to take the opportunity on behalf of myself and on behalf of all the committee to wish everyone a, a very happy holidays and a, and a safe holidays. And um, I look forward to uh, speaking to you again. Uh, we're losing you, Hugh. I think we've actually lost you, so uh, he's back. Uh, lost I'm back. Yeah. Yeah. Did, so, did anyone have any questions? John Hall's got his hand up. Yeah, the I liked your logo um, with the with the lights behind it. Who built that? Yeah. So I forgot to mention that was also uh, built by Aiden, oh, nice. Aiden Kelly, the secretary. So yeah. Very yeah, good. it did look good, didn't it? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, thanks, John. Are we going to have that on the outside of our building? <laughs> <laughs> Be nice and really big one, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All the way down uh, Warrigal Road would be nice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Richard's got his hand up. Did you manage to sign up a few new members? Um, well, not as yet, but um, we're hopeful no, I mean. that, yeah. I said we, we got some um, Coda Dojo sign ups. So. Yeah, I heard you say the Coda Dojo, but uh, I didn't see a stack of forms for applications for membership on the. Uh... <laughs> oh, actually, uh, yeah, by the time you got there, we'd run out of them. We had about 100. Oh, well, that's good. That we started with. And yeah, they all went by about two o'clock. So good. Yeah. Hopefully, some of those forms are used to actually sign up. Yeah. Anything else? Well, I've just got one question, Hugh, about next year. Um, are we going uh, physical or are we sticking with Zoom next year? Well, um, you know, I think my preference uh, would be to go back to physical and have hybrid meetings. Um, you know, I get the sense there are some some members that, that uh, you know, would like to come back to Moorabbin and would like to do things like the, the waffle thing. So that would certainly be, be my uh, preference and I'll discuss that with the rest of the committee. So um, so I can't give you a clear answer there, probably sound like, a bit like a, a politician, but um, yeah, that's my preference. Okay, that's fine. Okay, any further questions about President? Is that John Swale with his hand up? 
yeah, just uh, picking up on that, we had a, an Eastern Group's barbecue uh, on uh, Saturday and it was well attended. People wanted to have the physical interaction. We had uh, oh, John Thompson come up from Mornington. Uh, he wanted to meet the people he'd only seen on Zoom. So I think uh, certainly oh, well, from the Wadham House Group, I think we'd say that we want to run the, the hybrid meetings. Uh, we go to lunch afterwards. So we've got the best of both. We've got the interaction with everybody and we've got some social uh, access there. And I think that's what most of the people that, uh, that were there on Saturday wanted. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, hopefully we can make that happen for monthly meetings as well. John Hall again. Yeah, I, I, I would love to see Marabin, um become a bit more vibrant again. Uh, we, we, it, I mean, COVID couldn't have happened at a worse time. <laughs> we, we had our open day at Moorabbin, um, and and it was really well attended. My my granddaughter was um, demonstrating raspberry pies and whatever, and hopefully some of the kids that, that are coming through the Coda Dojo, they could show us uh, some some little things that they've been working on and whatever. So. I would really love to see us getting back to Moorabbin at some time. I probably won't attend the, the uh, monthly meetings at Moorabbin, though. I, I, I do like the hybrid Zoom meetings, and I, I do think we should keep that, keep it hybrid. Um, but, um, yeah, for sure, the, the Moorabbin rooms need to be, you know, they need to get back to what they were pre-COVID, if we can do that. That would be good. Yeah, well, yeah, I think I think hybrid's a good solution. Everyone, everyone can you know choose which sort of way they want to attend, and it works for everyone. Um, Cedric. Yeah, uh, I'll just second John Hall. Um, I can't remember when I was last at Moorabbin, but uh, I think I about twelve months before COVID came, I wasn't driving at night time because of cataracts. By the time I'd fixed my cataracts, COVID was in and. So it's probably about 2018, last time I was down at Moravan. Um, I'd like to get back there and attend a meeting and maybe get to a waffle sig. Um, the other thing I was going to say was a message just came up on my screen, somebody asking about um, some, uh, some of the text that had disappeared from the, I, I presume he was talking about the iHelp uh, page. Um, there's a complete rewrite needed and um, the thing's halfway through. So the majority of stuff that Leighton had um, uh, put up over a very long period is currently not available on the website. And um, it's just a matter of finding somebody who can get that all back up. I'm not sure how many members understood why there's so much stuff missing from the iHelp uh, site. Yeah, all right. Well, yeah, thank you for that. Anyone else? All right. Well, yeah, once again, thank you, everyone. And uh, like I said, happy holidays. And uh, we'll, I'll catch you next year. So. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, you. Um, thanks for that, and all the best to you and your family. Um, I'm not sure who the eye helper is uh, this month, but uh, Harry was there earlier, so. Uh... No, it's me, Peter. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I you get well, sick so of me. You probably handled a lot of the questions earlier, but I, I have you. Anyone got <laughs> questions for I help? Uh, here's your chance. Just before you pop into that, Peter, I'll, I'll, I'd like to just expose a couple of things that are happening uh, that are recurrent themes that are occurring to us and why. Uh, at this point in time, most members' Microsoft password has been changed. You, you have no use for it any longer. But uh, two things are occurring. Uh, one, of the, we, we changed them just so that we'd flush at anyone who's still using OneDrive. Uh, they'd be required to log into that contact list. But the other that's occurring is that some members 
had linked their computer to their Microsoft account and they're being requested to log in again. Uh, the fix is quite simple uh, for the Windows machine that only occurs on Windows machines. Uh, hop into settings, uh, hop into accounts, then navigate down to work or school accounts, select your Microsoft account, uh, and then click disconnect. And that will go away forever then. So it's a matter of just disconnecting your computer from the Microsoft accounts. And, uh, and, and that'll, that'll, uh, that'll make it happen. OneDrive has gone away as, as, as everyone's been alerted to, but uh, there are still remnants, of, a couple of remnants of people who are still using it. So we're dealing with them at the moment. The second came up a couple of days ago. Those members that are trying to renew their membership or some members can't do it through the website and pay via a credit card. According to Marlon, it's a, it's a, it's a problem that's occurred for a little while. And what, what it's requiring is a different email address to the email address for which you logged into the account. Now, Everyone has uh, an infinite number, or all members have an infinite number of Microsoft, uh, Microsoft uh, Google uh, email addresses. Uh, you using your normal email address, and my is mine is plynch at melpc.org.au. If you after the the username part, if you put a plus sign, you can put anything else you like after that, uh, and you'll still be able to. Um, receive email on that address uh, because the plus and everything after it or subsequent to that uh, up to the at sign is filled it out. That fools the payment system into thinking there's a new, a different email address and you'll be able to go uh, pay your subs uh, if, if you need to do it. Uh, and the third recurrent thing that I've personally dealt with a few times is third party antivirus uh, programs on people's computers. They have been causing some issues for doing normal things. Uh, one I picked up a month ago, uh, someone had AVG and the email protection enabled. That was preventing their Thunderbird from authenticating and re-authenticating. We had to disable uh, the email protection part of it for it to, um, for the uh, authentication to occur. But every time it re-authenticates, which is every couple of weeks, depending on, on your usage, uh, it fails. So you've got to disable it again. My advice, which the member rejected, was just remove the damn thing. Um, he didn't want to. Uh, Sophos caused another member issues. Uh, they couldn't install print, printer drivers. Uh, and it scratched their head a little bit. And it actually was Sophos. She had no idea why it was installed. Uh, so we and she wasn't using any of it anyway. So we we uninstalled that, and uh, the printer driver went in fine. Uh, do you want it restored, reinstalled? Said no. Nah. If it's, if it's uh, no good to me, I don't need it. So they're the three themes that that, that have happened to, uh, recurrently over the uh, last uh, few weeks. So I'll leave it open now for questions. Someone must have a question, or do you know it all, uh, members? If we silence. I'll, I'll expose a little bit more about uh, OneDrive to, to fill the, um, the, the, the dead air, um, Peter. We are in the process of backing up everyone's OneDrive files uh, just in case. They'll be available for several months. Uh, you just need to contact iHelp and we can give you a link uh, and you'll be able to download whatever you need. We've already had to date three people avail themselves of that service. It's not something we're publicizing, but uh, uh, and given that we've, we've, we've advised everyone six months ago that OneDrive is going, going away, do something with it. Uh, but it has been done, uh, and uh, we've done 99% of members. We've got a couple of major users that are still to be done. 
John Hall. Uh, Philip, have you heard a rumour at all that um, that Google are going to increase their drive space? I, I heard it at the club the other day and uh, down at Wadham House, and I haven't been able to confirm that, but... Um, uh, no, I haven't. Uh, okay. I, in fact, Mr Google has is, is gone a slightly different way for, for, for us. When we signed up... Uh, we got 30 gigs per member, individual members could purchase additional space. Uh, that luxury has now gone away. Uh, it has to be purchased corporately for all members. So if you needed more than 30 gig, uh, you could buy it. You could have bought it. Um, I guess you were grandfathered in. But if you didn't, now you can't. Uh, I heard him, but can, can, we buy it, can we buy it through... No, no. It, 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 my understanding is everyone said so we're currently on 30. If we want everyone to have 100 gig, we have to buy 100 gig for everyone. Or if we want anyone to have 100 gig, we have to buy it for everyone. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> but I offer a, just a couple of matters of interest, that both of which I've discussed with Philip, to do with the email transition. <clears throat> um, both these misfortunes befell a single member. One of them, I suspect, may well befall other members, but they are connected. The, the member we've been talking to in his Microsoft Desktop Outlook, which is his main email program, told me he was... He lost sight of two of his inboxes. Now, this was rather mystifying to me when he told me on the phone. When I saw his outlook, <clears throat> I noticed that there were two folders in Outlook called Inbox. Both of them had an underline in front of them, and the other one of them had two in brackets after it. And I hope Hugh can hear this because I think I've got a hypothesis about what the cause of that was. Um, namely, that when the migration tool moves moved email from a folder in Microsoft where there was already a default label stroke folder in Google it would put an underline in front of the import, not to get it confused with the, the resident Gmail label. So my member was looking at these two. Now the disappearance is, I think, an independent phenomenon. Um, his, his, um, his outlook was really struggling to cope and one feature of his setup was that he had probably 80 subfolders in each of those two, all with the same names, of course, because I suspect what happened was that there was, a, there was an update to the migration and a whole new set of folder labels, in fact, was created in Gmail. A connected issue which would only affect people who had something like that going on it was explained to me by Philip earlier today, but I'll just pass it on because it's, it, it's, it's a subtlety that presumably all the clients like Outlook. No, wait a minute, Outlook and Thunderbird may be different here. We'll check that in a moment. Outlook, if if I, if I, if I, if you if you have in Google a single email that has distinct labels which exist in are attached to other parent labels, Google just effectively puts pointers there. There's only ever one copy of that email. Now this rather foxes. Outlook, 
because it's built on the familiar principle of say that the, the file structure in, in, in Windows, it, you can't have the same file in two different folders in Windows. You can't have the same email in two different email folders in Outlook. So it can't goes and copies them. So this creates a certain amount of bloating, but it was causing the, the, the sharp end of that is that my member wanted to delete the duplicates that he saw. The trouble is that if you, that whereas Outlook locally had two, two emails, when Outlook went back and was going to go back and shake hands with Google, Google would say, you've deleted that single message. So probably there's one other member and nobody else who will have this experience because it, you have to think how it could happen that the same email is in two, is in two places. And the explanation here, I think, is because of a double migration of the same email that, that wasn't picked up as the, the same email in the process. But if you do see duplicates in your non-Gmail client, be a bit careful because there might only be one message really when the synchronization takes place. Can I just pause at that point and ask the Thunderbird experts if Thunderbird also does that? Because I have a vague memory that one of those two clients does use pointers. In other words, it doesn't create a duplicate message, a whole extra message. Harry, based on my ex ex experimentation, the response is sometimes. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, because Thunderbird stores folder messages in inbox format they're in they're in one file right, right. Uh, per folder right i earlier this year to satisfy an itch and to help someone else out i created several uh well i, I stand about a hundred i think emails i popular i had an email address a gws email address i populated with a hundred hundred um messages created a whole series of folders and and tagged many of those messages with those folder names when it replicated back to thunderbird i the synchronization finished i then shut down thunderbird and i examined each of the inboxes some of them had all the messages some of them had some of the messages physically contained in the inbox. Uh, but they all they all the messages showed up when you looked at it through the Thunderbird. So my response is it does it sometimes. Right, right. I, I don't know why. And it's not something I have actively pursued, but when I retire and I get a bit of time, uh, on my list of 223 tasks is to actually look at that. I suppose, anyway, I, I take it because of the relationship between Gmail's storage structure and any client using, well, the folder system, it's wise to be careful about concluding because you see two instances of what seem to be the same, same email that it's safe to delete either of them mm. because you keep the other one, think, believing you'll keep the other one, Philip. Yes, it, 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 it is unsafe. Yeah, my member was desperate to delete one of the two whole folder trees because he was convinced it was redundant. Mm. Um, he managed to delete them both at one point, but that's another story. He lost them because they were down there in the bin and we had to go to the bottom of the garbage and get them out. But mm. that's, it. That's, a, that's a logically independent part of the story. Yeah. Uh, look, when... when as you and I discussed over this matter, Harry, uh, the safest thing and fastest, by the way, uh, in tidying up fault instructions uh, in GWS is actually to do it via the web client and then let your desktop client sync. 
Yeah, and as Philip knows too, I was struggling with the challenge of doing that by having a filter or search in Google that will line up those quotes duplicates where you're using subfolders or sub labels. If you search, you can't. If you search on a parent label in Google, you only get the parent mm. node. You don't get the children. Mm. I mean, I, th I think he can do it another way because actually his his subfolders or sub labels are all labels of senders, names of senders. So you can just search on sender X and you get the lot. Any questions for Philip? Not a question, but just simply um, an observation. And I'm sure that Harry, Philip, uh, and Jeff A. Moore will also agree that um, there are infinite ways in which our members appear to use their emails and how they store them and deal with them. We've come across some who uh, just have an inbox. Don't worry about anything else. Don't, don't classify anything. We've got an inbox. And once I've read something, I delete it all. All right, that's that's not my way of doing it, but that's the way some people do it. Others are <laughs> compelled to create a new folder for almost every email, and uh, that's that's when they end up with eighty or a hundred or two hundred, and we've seen as many as two hundred plus folders full of emails. Well, some might only have one email in, but you know, that's that's the way that person sorts things. And so it goes on. So the transition support team, it was the, the four of us, we learnt a lot about how our members use their emails uh, or misuse them or don't even know how they're doing it. But it, it's been over the last two years that we've been involved with that. It's been a real learning experience for our um, transition team members. And so I'll, I'll thank all the members, particularly those that are here, uh, and maybe many that are not here on the, the meeting, for uh, giving us this education, which has been wonderful. Yeah, but it sounds to me like we could give you an evening to talk about, about how to handle all our emails and store them. You, you obviously know it all now. Uh, I know how I do it. And that's completely different to the way most others would do it. But I'm not yeah. saying it's any better. It's just that it suits me. Peter, uh, present company entirely accepted. There are many old dogs in Mel PC. I mean, there's a short answer to what you say is that what we've, as it were, stumbled into, though I was taught this many years ago by a former member of Mail PC, is that Google Mail, whatever you think of the interface and so on, has an extraordinarily rapid search facility, which with a, a modicum of attention to the way the interface works, can produce extremely useful results which also makes the kind of effort that Stuart mentioned of storing things in filing cabinets, as it were, um, redundant, because you can search on just about anything you like and get up what you want to find anyway. And a very simple example, because I just gave it, you see, was, and he's not the only member, I, I know one other member who had a hundred folders in, um, uh, in Outlook, and it, it was a, there was an issue about how we managed to migrate that system uh, into Google. 
<clears throat> but he had a folder for every sender. Now, even in Microsoft Outlook, you can sort by sender without using folders at all, right? But you can filter very easily to a sender uh, in, in Google. So why waste you all that time when you could be out sunbathing rather than moving email around? Richard, do you have a comment or a question? Yeah, question. Uh, I see you talking about emails. Uh, in Thunderbird, if I mark an email as junk, all it, all it does seems to do is put a little flame, red flame symbol against the email. It doesn't actually move it to the junk folder. So is there some other setting that I should be looking for? Yeah, perhaps, perhaps I could comment on that. I, I use Thunderbird and whenever I click on that little flame symbol, it instantly throws it into the spam folder and or junk folder, whatever you want to call it. And uh, that's what it's meant to do. So there must be some other setting that I'm missing out on. That, as I say, when I mark it as junk, it just puts the flame symbol there, but it stays in the inbox. Oh, maybe you should explore all your settings. There are a lot of them. <laughs> It may, in fact, be a glitch. Uh, one thing I've noticed is that Thunderbird does has very good online help. And all you need to do is click on the help and it'll direct you to a, you know, it'll log into your browser and you just put in your question, you know, why doesn't my uh, junk email go into junk when I, when I click the flame and see what you get. It may be something that you need to uh, dig into the innards of Thunderbird to, to fix. And that is sometimes the case. Cedric. Yes. Um, while we're talking about Thunderbird, uh, one thing that seems to have just started happening in the last week or so, which is quite irritating. Um, where I have normally, if I go into a folder that contains a couple of hundred emails in Thunderbird, um, I can sort it by, normally uh, the default sorting is by uh, date, but I can also, just by like clicking, sort it by other, the other columns, by subject or by, um, person who's involved and it puts sent and received emails from Fred Nurk together. Um, just lately, instead of sorting everything alphabetically, um, all the emails in a particular thread are sorted together. And I know that an email was sent to me in the beginning and the 10th of November, and I know there is another part for this um, thread on the 30th of November. When I look in the 30th of November, I can't find the thing. The irritating part about it is that it isn't reliably identifying what's part of a one thread. Sometimes it puts an email that's a different um, subject into that thread, and then it's pretty impossible to find that one. Um, this has only started happening in the last week or so. I'm wondering if you know what setting has caused this, or is it a new, um, have they issued a new version of Thunderbird, which has uh, got a bug in it or what? It is a new feature in Thunderbird, which when I first came across it a, well, a couple of weeks back, I thought, what on earth is going on? And it is threading. So if you if you select, uh, say, the inbox, you select the inbox, but it will happen with other folders. Uh, go to view, and then scroll down to threads. 
and I'll just see if I can do that now. Sorry, what was the first one you go to? Uh, so select the inbox, go to yes. view in your oh, view, yes, uh, in the um, the menu bar. Yep. Then go to threads. Uh, oh, one on. Is it threads? Yep. Uh, no, it's not threads. No, go to sort by. And then you go down the bottom of the list in sort by. And you'll find that threaded is ticked. And then okay. you un untick that. And that should restore it back to just sorting by date or whatever you wish. Um, I'm just looking at one box and one of the boxes, not the one I'm having any trouble with, um, unthreaded is ticked. So maybe when I get to the box I'm having trouble, it's the un, uh, it'll be threaded. Yeah, so and it's, it's a view. To unthreaded. It's okay. a view and sort by. So yeah. if you go, if you follow that trail, uh, you should be able to to cure that particular thing. I I thought it was an awful thing for them to do to us, but <laughs> but then I found a use for it. So occasionally I'll I'll implement it or de-implement it, depending yeah. on what I'm wanting to do. Okay, that's pretty much told me where to look. Yeah, it's a little bit like the Google Webmail um, conversation view. Yeah which also irritates me no end. Yep. Okay. It Thanks. can that be answers, useful. That answers the question. I've just reproduced Richard Bradford's problem by clicking the little spam icon. Uh, in Thunderbird and the messages are sitting there. And I switched to the spam folder and back in case that would wake it up and it didn't. So I don't know what's going on there. Still there on my inbox. Yeah, so I just clicked on a an email in the inbox and it's gone immediately to spam as I requested. There must be a setting somewhere, mustn't there, if we're seeing if we deny about seeing the other thing. Or well, <clears throat> it shouldn't just be the version, should it? I mean there has to be a Well mine's <clears throat> I think mine's the latest. And if anybody is <clears throat> is automatic um getting automatic updates, then they would also have the same version. According to my notes, Harry, it's, uh, Stuart, it's under account settings, uh, junk settings, uh, under the email account, and then in the destination retention part, uh, you, you need to enable turn on new junk messages to and choose a junk folder. In account settings? All right, it's yeah. So otherwise it just sits there. Yes. That's the default. Yes, so you, got, you accept a nominated junk folder and enable move new junk messages. It's under, it's in- um, Oh, junk settings. settings. Junk settings in the destination retention. Now that's just, I have no recollection of this mm. at all. That's just notes I took when I encountered this issue with someone some time ago. When I, okay, so you have to do that per account. I'm mm -hmm. looking at my Melbourne PC account. So yes, the, the box wasn't ticked, but the, the, I still would have to, I've got to find the, 
nominate yeah. the available folder. It was already there for the other one. So, so that's that's the answer for Richard then to go into the account settings, junk settings, and mm. make sure that his destination and retention uh, mm. is ticked appropriately. Who would have thunk that about junk? <laughs> you have to. Well, oh, I, no, I notice you can automatically delete your junk mail older than however many days. Yes. Which Google does for you if you put it in the right place. As long as the IMAP is working. Mm. It's, a, it's a funny beast, Thunderbird, isn't it? That's kind of very old fashioned and nerdy, that one, isn't it? Oh, it's very good. <laughs> Where do I find the account settings and junk settings? Uh, go to tools and account settings. That's assuming that you can see the menu bar. If you can't see the menu bar, you right click in the very top of Thunderbird and tick menu bar and it will appear. Alternatively, you can press the Alt key and T for tools. Yeah, no, I've, I've got it now. Oh, well, you can right click, right click the root of any of the listed accounts. <laughs> that too. Settings. It, it's, it's like many programs. You've got a dozen ways of doing anything. Pick one. Well, it's uh, two minutes past nine. We started at two minutes past seven. Um, for the members that uh, want to know about iHelp, you've just seen a live demonstration of the iHelp team helping a member. So uh, if you have any problems, this is a good ad for uh, members to use iHelp. The iHelp people might be too happy about that. But. Um, <laughs> We'll it's close a bit... the meeting. Uh, we've been going for two hours. Thank you, Philip. You've, um, if you didn't know, uh, you filled in uh, the two hours with a bit of help from uh, a couple of other people and the president giving his report. Um, so thank you all for attending. Our next meeting, we, we're not meeting on New Year's Day. Our next meeting will be Wednesday, the 1st of February. And um, we'll be advised whether it's going to be physical, uh, Zoom or um, hybrid. But uh, <coughs> can I take this opportunity to wish you all a uh, Merry Christmas, uh, a prosperous New Year, um, depending how the gas and electricity prices go, but a Happy New Year, and I look forward to seeing you all next year. <laughs>